If you've joined us on Facebook or YouTube or on our website, we welcome, we're glad you found us. Our desire is that your worship with us today will rise as a pleasing aroma to heaven. We urge you to share what you have found and come back every week. We begin with Helen reading the scriptures for today. Thank you. I'll start reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14 and selected verses. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and yet will see and yet you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. What a sight that must have been. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. The next reading is from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 34. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews, Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to these who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I have baptized with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit coming down and remain on the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testified that this is God's chosen one. Then we have one more scripture from Revelation 21, verse 6. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Now we turn this service over to Jeff, who will be doing our message for today. Thank you, Helen, and good morning, Bethel. It's a joy to see everybody here for worship on this Sabbath day. Today we're going to be reading from the book of Mark in a very similar uh, section to what you just heard 
Helen read you, but we're going to look at it from a, a slightly different perspective. Now, we think today that Mark was the first uh, gospel that was written. Um, we don't know a lot about Mark. We've heard, we, we assume some things from what we read in uh, some of Paul's letters and in Acts, but we don't know for sure everything about the author. We do think, though, that he was the first one to write down the story in, of uh, Jesus's life in a gospel. And we know that almost everything that's in Mark is also repeated in the other synoptic gospels in Matthew and in Luke. About 90% of Mark shows up in those two as well, which also kind of reinforces the thought that Mark's gospel was the first one. But Mark has a rather unique style. Um, he moves along very quickly in his gospel. He omits a lot of the details you'll read in some other in uh, Matthew and Luke, including in what you read uh, just now in John. But nevertheless, that, um, that focused approach of Mark helps to serve, I think, to focus us on um, the true subject of what he's writing about, which is Jesus. On one hand, he leaves out some details. On the other hand, he keeps us well-focused and keeps the main thing the main thing. So in today's lectionary reading, uh, very common to read about uh, Jesus' baptism during the first Sunday of Lent. Um, this year in the lectionary, we're reading from Mark, as I mentioned, and the section that's in the lectionary actually takes us through three stories very, very quickly in uh, six, seven short verses. Um, so let's start with um, a reading from Mark this morning. So at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've had a chance to take a look at three stories, Jesus' baptism, sending him out in the wilderness, and then beginning to preach his story. Jesus' baptism is covered in a lot of, a lot of different areas. Um, we have a picture here that was done um, a, a long time ago, and there's a lot of great artwork um, with Jesus' baptism as the topic. We're going to spend a little time today talking about baptism and talking about the importance of, of Jesus' baptism and, and where it fits in to the greater story. Many times when we talk about the baptism of Jesus, we focus on the, the theological paradox of someone who is without sin being baptized. Now, Mark doesn't give us much information in that. Matthew gives us a little more, and, re, and Matthew lists uh, Jesus' comment that he did it to fulfill all righteousness. We're not going to spend much time on that today, but instead focus on some other parts of Jesus' baptism that still apply to us today. You know, it's interesting that back prior to that, there was some baptism in the Jewish faith, but not at all like John was doing it or like we do it today. Um, since then, baptism has become a sacrament in the church, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But What's important to note in this is that baptism, in this case, serves to provide us some valuable lessons. You know, it's important to note, sometimes we think that baptism really starts our journey with the church. But for those who study, and, and uh, whether we're talking about the concept of prevenient grace, how God touches us before we even know it's happening, or whether we go all the way back to Genesis, it's clear that God loved the world and loved us prior to our baptism. 
we of course would agree that God loved Jesus before he was baptized. And that same love and that same grace extends to us too prior to our baptism. But we read in Matthew where Jesus said the, the purpose of his baptism was to fulfill all righteousness. What did that mean? Well, part of it was that Jesus wanted to experience what we experience. As humans on earth, Jesus was, was, uh, was dedicated to living his life as we live our lives, to see exactly through our viewpoint and understand what we go through so that we are better able to understand his direction and his mission for us. But I can also imagine that uh, the Jesus at one point was, was wondering when he would actually start his ministry. And maybe once he heard that John was out baptizing, that gave him the signal that it was time to go out and start his public ministry today. But you know, back then, John's baptism was one of repentance, and we read about that over and over. John, John when, uh, when he would baptize, told everyone to repent. And because of that, it might be interesting to take a look at that word repent and perhaps kind of reset our definition of repentance. Today, when we talk about repentance, we frequently talk about turning away from evil, turning away from sin, and that certainly is a part of it. But I would encourage you to think of it in a slightly different way. And rather than focus on the turning away from sin, focus on turning toward God. And the reason I mention that is I can, I can turn away from sin and not necessarily turn toward God. I have no doubt there are plenty of pious folks in other religions, pious Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims, who live very honorable lives. But just because they've turned away from sin doesn't mean they've turned toward God. On the other hand, if we look at repentance as turning toward God, then by definition, we're turning away from sin. By definition, we're focused on the right things. So it's a good way to maybe take a look at, at, um, at that repentance and focus on that but also realize that baptism has, has changed a bit over time. While John focused on repentance later in the church and certainly in today's modern mainline denominations of Christianity, we focus on a baptism slightly different. Let's take a look at the official United Methodist Church viewpoint on baptism. This comes from the Articles of Religion and specifically in Article 17, where we learn that baptism is not only a sign of profession, and mark of difference whereby Christ Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized, but is also a sign of regeneration or the new birth. You know, that's a slightly different definition than what John the Baptist gave us earlier. But, but what a great gift that is. It's not only a mark of difference, it's a mark of ownership. It's a mark of God's ownership. It's a mark of God's stamp on us. Baptism is not designed to for us to hold it over others that aren't. Baptism is designed for us to uh, to revel and rejoice and praise in God's holding of us, in the fact that we're working towards God's mission and God's accomplishments. But let's take another look that's a little more detailed than that. Let's take a look at what John Wesley had to say on baptism. And he listed five keys that he thought were important to know about baptism. And you'll read them there on the slide. The cleansing of the guilt of original sin, initiated into a covenant with God, admitted into the church, made an heir of the divine kingdom, and spiritually born anew. Spiritually born anew. You know, some of these admitted in the church, there's a... Um, uh, that's important, but, but being spiritually born anew and made an heir of the divine kingdom, those are the things that I want to praise God for. Um, you know, it, it, we've seen a lot of folks go through baptism, and many folks are on the call that watch, watch me get baptized eight or 
nine, 10 years ago, however long ago it was. But the fact is that, that knowing that you're spiritually born anew and made an heir of the divine kingdom, in my mind, makes it very hard not to repent. And so it goes back to that definition. Uh, the, Wesley also seems to look at it as turning toward God, not simply repentance. Baptism doesn't mean we're safe from everything that'll happen in the world, but it does help us vanquish the beasts of today. If you're interested in learning more about baptism, on the first floor by the elevators in the brochure rack, you'll see some brochures about baptism, a, a very small little 10-page brochure that kind of summarizes baptism in the United Methodist Church. Additionally, our longer form statement on baptism is called By Water and the Spirit. This was approved in the 1996 General Conference. If you're interested in taking a look at that, let me know, and we'll be happy to get you a more detailed copy of what we think about baptism. But additionally, if you want to know how the United Methodist Church looks at baptism, as well as a more detailed um, explanation of a couple of things we talked about just now, who can perform baptisms in the United Methodist Church? And you heard me say General Conference of 1996. If you're interested in what a General Conference does and what it means to the church, I invite you to join us on Wednesday evening for a Zoom class called Methodism 101. We'll spend a couple hours going into some of the details. Uh, the first hour talks about the philosophy of the United Methodist Church, and the second hour we'll talk more about um, what a general conference is, what a district superintendent is, what's the difference between an elder and a deacon in the United Methodist Church. So if you're new to the United Methodist Church, or if you've been around a while and just want some more details as to how it all works, feel free to join us on Wednesday evening um, we'll be sending the link out via email, so feel free to uh, join as you can. Um, you don't need any materials. You don't need any homework. Uh, we'll cover it all on Wednesday night, and you might, uh, you might learn something you didn't know before. All right. Now, you know, you don't often hear commercials in the middle of a message, so let's get back to our main program. Another point of what G uh, Jesus experienced in the baptism was that this is one of those great moments in the history of the New Testament where you can easily see the power of the Trinity. Trinity is a hard concept to get our minds around, at least it is for me and perhaps for you too. But here you see it. Um, when Jesus is in the water, the heavens rip open and the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. Not as a dove, but like a dove. Softly, gently the way the Holy Spirit comes down on us when we're baptized as well. And notice that the, the heavens were ripped open. This was nothing that we generated. This was generated from up above. And it was clear in that moment that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were united in that moment. And I not only love that picture as a Christian, but I also love it because it makes it much easier to explain to folks about the Trinity. Ultimately, in this case, Jesus was about to begin something new, his public ministry. And whenever there's something new beginning in the Bible, God and the Holy Spirit are there. In fact, when we go all the way back to the beginning, we're going to see that. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God and Jesus and the Spirit were there back in the days of Genesis. And here again at Jesus' baptism, we see all three parts of the Godhead present. Well, in typical Mark style, we don't learn a lot about the baptism. He doesn't spend a lot of time on it. And immediately he tells us that Jesus was sent out into the wilderness. It's interesting that in Mark's gospel, the Greek word he uses for send really is better interpreted as drove. Jesus was drove out in the wilderness. The other gospels use a Greek word that, that implies led out. Two different uh, concepts there, but in either way, Jesus went out into the wilderness and was, was tempted we read in the other Gospels by Satan. 
We're not going to spend much time on the details of that, but but the important important part to note as we go through Lent is that just as the angels attended Jesus right there, angels attend us too. Jesus was just baptized. It didn't save him from being tempted. It didn't save him from having to go through uh, uh, some trials. And baptism doesn't keep us safe either from those trials. But the key point is not that we're going to avoid the trials. The key point is that as Jesus was attended by angels in the wilderness, when we go through trials, God is there as well. No matter what trial, no matter what temptation, we can call on God and call on the Holy Spirit to give us the power to know what to do and to know how to do it. What a great story. And then right after that, Jesus goes into Galilee and then talks again about repentance. Jesus starts his public ministry. So he's baptized, he makes it through the wilderness, and then immediately he starts to go out to talk about um, the new life that's ahead for us. You know, last weekend, we weren't with you. Carol and I took a little trip. We went to Louisville in between storms, uh, managed to get it in there. And um, on one of the days we were in Louisville, we drove down. We were in the, the heart of the city and just kind of stumbled on a small little deli called the Tunerville Deli. Decided we stopped there and eat. Had a, a sandwich that may have been the best deli sandwich I've ever had in my life. Really friendly staff, really great experience. And it's one of those where you just kind of stumble onto some place and it turns out to be an outstanding place to eat. Now, those who know me know that I'm not a strong social media guy. I'm on Facebook and Twitter, but it's pretty rare that I ever post anything. Um, but I was so impressed by the, the owner and how the place ran and the staff and the quality of the food then I couldn't help going on and posting a couple of reviews. I did one on Facebook and I did one on, on Yelp just to, uh, to be able to um, celebrate the success of this uh, really cool little deli. When something good happens, it's hard for me not to tell others. When something good happens to me, that's when I, I, I want to tell everybody. I'm not one of those guys who, when I have a bad experience, I'm quick to put it on social media. Nothing wrong with that, but I tend to, uh, personally, I tend to focus more on the positive experiences, and I want to put positive experiences out there for others to know. You know, that is part of human nature, and, and Jesus shows that well in the story that Mark tells us. He gets baptized. He goes out in the wilderness. And the first thing he does is start talking about God and praising God. He's been through a lot in a, what we assume is a relatively short amount of time. And yet he can't stop talking about it. He can't stop telling others the good news. Jesus starts preaching the good news immediately after going through a baptism and a trial. So in Mark's clipped, shortened way, I think he's kind of helped us focus for Lent. By leaving out a lot of details, he keeps us, he keeps us focused on what the main thing is. And the main thing, in this case, is Jesus. By keeping the details short and by keeping the, um, the, uh, the prose um, uh, quick, he can help us stay focused on the main thing. So what does that mean for us? So on your Lent journey that we're about to be, that we started last Wednesday, that you're in right now, here's three things to take from this story that you can, you can uh, learn from. First, focus on God. What Jesus did when he baptized, we all admit he was, he was sin-free. He didn't need baptism, but he was focused on fulfilling God's mission. So he was quick to stand in line with the rest of us and say, I'm one of them and get baptized as well. During this time of Lent, if we focus on God, if we make that the main thing, maybe you do that through increased public service. Maybe you do that with increased prayer time. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a, a more intentional series of Bible reading. Or maybe it's all three. But if we focus on God during this time of Lent, we're certain to be doing the right thing 
and certain to be doing it the right way. Then the next lesson to learn is to go somewhere. Go somewhere different. And I don't mean physically go somewhere necessarily, but I mean go somewhere different in your ministry. Maybe you've not reached out or thought about the homeless population or those who are hungry or prison ministries or those who are uh, those seeking justice. That can take a lot of different ways, and I'm not saying any one way is the right way to do it. All I'm asking you to do is to think about someplace different, something different you can do with your ministry, even if it's just writing a letter to somebody in prison. A simple ministry change during Lent may focus you more on God, and that may be better um, for all of us. Don't be afraid of the wilderness, because no matter what happens, angels will attend you just as they attended Jesus. So often during this time of Lent, we say, well, I don't want to go there. That's, yeah, that's going to be tough. Man, that's going to be difficult. I don't know if I want to do that. I think the lesson from Mark is we shouldn't be afraid of both going somewhere new and being afraid of, of what's out there. And lastly, follow the model that Jesus said. Praise God as you go. After getting baptized and getting out in the wilderness, Jesus starts talking about the good news immediately. And no matter what happens to us in Lent or how hard it is or what, what you may give up or what you may change in your life, if we praise God while we do it, if we say, I just found something great and I got to tell you about it, and I got to praise God for letting me tell you about it, you know what? I, I have a feeling that this is going to be more than just your average everyday season of Lent. We still have a lot going on in this country. Um, we still have a lot of hardships and a lot of folks waiting for tests, waiting for results, waiting for a vaccine. Folks who can only see their loved ones through the pain, a pane of glass or a screen on a phone. Our trials aren't over yet. But if we find somewhere new, we focus on God and we praise God's name as we go, this just may be the best Lent you've ever experienced. Amen. All right, so now let's uh, let's change a, a slight focus here. And, and if you've heard this, maybe you thought as you listen to this message that um, you don't really have the relationship with God that you would like to. Maybe you're thinking that you had a relationship with God and you've kind of let it slide and you've kind of kind of gone off to do some other stuff and maybe you're not as focused on God as you once were. So I want to offer you a chance to to make a right turn, make a U-turn, make a change as you go. And so if you if you don't know Jesus yet, if you've not yet um, experienced God, I invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I welcome you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Or if you've already been a disciple of Jesus for some time and you're and you feel like you may not be on the same track anymore or, or life or COVID or culture has taken you away, then think about saying this prayer right now. Lord Jesus, by your grace, accept me once again as your faithful disciple. Amen. If you prayed one of these two prayers, we know that if you've accept Jesus, accepted Jesus, we know that Jesus has accepted you. And know this as well, whether you're just starting your journey with God or whether you've been a disciple for a long time, if you don't have a church home, Bethel United Methodist Church accepts you as well. Whoever you are, whatever you're dressed like, wherever you live, doesn't make a difference. We'll be happy to not only shower you with the friendship that we've been known for for almost 150 years now, but we'll do this. We'll help you grow in your relationship with God. We'll help you become a better Christian and we'll help you find peace and contentment and joy that you didn't even know was possible. And I'm speaking from personal experience as a guy who didn't know Jesus not that long ago. Bethel's the place to, to make a change. So if you don't have a church home, I invite you to, uh, to consider Bethel United Methodist Church. All right, let's continue with our service now and joys and concerns. 